Welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and this is female reproductive physiology. So if you recall, we left off speaking about female reproductive anatomy, and it was a pretty quick lecture. It seemed like maybe female reproductive anatomy was not that complex, but we'll see that it is. So what I'm going to do is start out with a brief overview of what the ovary looks like, and then we'll dive into oogenesis and follicular genesis after that. So if you think about it, what a female reproductive system is trying to do is produce an oocyte to go and meet with a male uh, spermatocyte so that we can reproduce and propagate the species. So in order to get that, we have these ovaries, the primary sex organs, and we said that we could find these follicles in various stages of development. So oocytes are the gametes, and then they're going to have these follicles growing around them. Those changes in the follicles are really what's going to be guided by the female HPG axis. So we'll get there in a minute. Uh, but let's just kind of quickly review the structures so that we can get to the physiology. So the oocyte is the female gamete. And if you recall, we said that the outer part of an ovary was the germinal um, outer cortex, and then it had an inner medulla. And our oocytes are hanging out here, and they're surrounded by follicles. So these are going to be the cells that develop to support the oocyte. And I'm actually going to use different colors. I'll use pink as my oocyte. And our first type of follicle is called the primordial follicle. And in a primordial follicle, we have our oocyte. And just one little layer, just one little layer of pregranulosa cells. So our primordial follicle has our oocyte, and we'll just call them pregranulosa cells. And we said then that we also had uh, primary follicles, and in a primary follicle, we have our oocyte. And now this still has just like one little layer of pregranulosa cells. But they're starting to respond to FSH, so they're a little bigger than in our primordial follicle. Our primordial follicles actually develop in utero. So a female is born with all of the oocytes she'll ever have, and they're arrested in development in this primordial follicle stage. So if we look at it, the oocyte is still diploid. It's arrested in development, and so it hasn't completed meiosis. So then these primary oocytes, we're still 2N. We still really only have one layer of these um, pregranulosa cells. Uh, and they are going to still be responding to really what happens is starting at puberty, these things are going to be responding to FSH and continue developing and getting bigger and bigger. And from puberty to menopause, um, this, they're going to develop into these secondary follicles. And so in the secondary follicles, we're still 2N, uh, arrested in meiosis. And, but now what we're doing is we're getting more and more of these now definitely granulosa cells. And in our later secondary follicles, we'll see the appearance of a third cell type, our fecal cells. And so there will only ever be two layers of fecal cells, but we can have secondary follicles in various stages of development. So secondary follicles are bigger, and what we could say about our secondary follicles is that they've got our oocyte. So our secondary follicles still have our oocyte that is still diploid. We're getting more granulosa cells. So we're getting granulosa cells. And then we're getting more and more granulosa cells. They're dividing by mitosis in response to uh, FSH. And then as we move throughout the secondary follicle stage, we'll see the appearance of first a theca interna, but then a theca externa. So these two layers of what are called thecal cells. And these are the targets for LH. So all throughout life, females have various follicles in various stages 
of development, and then from puberty until menopause, one of those secondary follicles a month is going to be rescued, and it's going to um, kind of finish meiosis one, and then get arrested in meiosis two. And meiosis two will only complete if there's fertilization. But let's finish thinking about meiosis one. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the nitty gritty details of meiosis because again, you should have learned that in Gen Bio. But what happens is that all of these secondary follicles are arrested in meiosis one, and then one of them per month from puberty to menopause is going to be selected and to, to finish meiosis one, and then it's haploid. Well, so what's going to happen is it's going to split because if you remember in spermatogenesis, we started with these full chromosome content, two N. So that's one from mom, one from dad, full complete. And what happens at the end is you have, in meiosis one, you have crossing over of maternal and paternal information. And then in meiosis two, you split all of that into half sets of information to go mix with another haploid cell. And each of those haploid cells is different from the parent and different from its, uh, its sibling daughter cells. Uh, but here what's going to happen is only one set of information is going to be passed on in this oocyte. So what happens when we continue meiosis 1 and 2 is that all of that information, that extra, chromosomal, that extra chromosomal information gets shipped off in what's called polar bodies. So what happens every month, again kind of coming back, what happens every month from these secondary follicles is one is going to be selected to become a tertiary or antral follicle. So we said these had about a million names. Antral, Raphian, Vesicular, all of those names. And what's going to happen in that is that it's going to complete meiosis one. Half of the information is going to go off and be lost in the first two polar bodies. So what happens here is now we have our oocyte and it will complete, so our oocyte completes meiosis one and we lose two polar bodies that take off half of the chromosomal information. So we lose what we have then is this oocyte that's going to be arrested in meiosis two. So this one is going to be ovulated. So this is our oocyte that's going to be ovulated from a vesicular follicle. And what happens is that when we're going from this secondary follicle to a tertiary follicle, your late secondary follicles, you start seeing the appearance of an antrum, this fluid-filled space. In your tertiary follicle, that antrum is going to get huge and be full, filled with antral fluid. That antral fluid is going to push the oocyte to the edge. And when we have an LH surge, what's going to happen is this wall is going to weaken right here. And this oocyte is going to pop off. And it's like such a violent process that leaves scar tissue. A well-trained uh, gynecologist can feel which ovary you ovulated off of because of the tissue that remains. So you push this oocyte to the edge, and the LH surge is going to cause here and you, you rupture. So one tertiary um, follicle a month is going to develop and that's the one that ovulates. So if we were to look at ovulation or draw a picture of it, what would it look like? We get our follicle is going to come right up here and like pop off. And the oocyte now is going to continue its journey through the female reproductive tract. So here's our oocyte and it's arrested in meiosis two, which means that it still has to eject half of the chromosome content. That only happens if fertilization occurs. So technically, if you think of a mature oocyte as being an oocyte that is haploid, yeah, <laughs> haploid and ready to um, combine with a haploid uh, spermatid, then you only ever have mature oocytes as often as you get fertilized. Because meiosis II does not complete unless fertilization does. If fertilization occurs, then the first thing that happens is that meiosis II completes, the third polar body is lost, and then the cell divisions that begin giving rise to uh, what will eventually become a baby occur. So it's pretty cool. So this oocyte is going to go off and continue its journey through the duct system that we can talk about in a minute, but I want to finish talking about this female anatomy up here in the ovary. Because here in the ovary, people tend to just kind of forget that there's still a bunch of stuff.
stuff going on in the ovary. With this oocyte, when it's called the cumulus oophorus or the cloud of the oocyte, it goes with it, and these are some granulosa cells that are going to help it have some nutrients for it on its journey through the duct system. But all of the rest of the cells that remain now are going to become this important structure, the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is going to secrete progesterone, and that is going to be progestation. Well, what can happen after we ovulate? We can fertilize that egg and gestate. So now we need to get our uterus ready for that. So this will become the cord. Well, let me draw you a new picture. Uh, at first, um, it's a little small, but then it gets a little bigger, and it's going to become this structure called the corpus luteum. So this is the corpus luteum. And it forms from all of the cells that remain in the ovary after ovulation. So it's all cells in the ovary after ovulation. Before we called them legal cells and granulosa cells, now we're just going to call them the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum is going to respond to declining levels of LH to pump out progesterone and be progestation. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Now, if you do not fertilize this, then this will just, this unfertilized oocyte will pass out of the female duct system and you know, flush it down the toilet or something, wash it down the drain, I don't know. And so if that happens, then if there's no fertilization, then there won't be any signals coming from this fertilized thing in the uterus, and so the corpus luteum will degenerate and become this thing called the corpus albicans. And a corpus albicans is just scar tissue. So the more times a woman ovulates, the more scar tissue she has on the outside. And so that can be one of the factors that makes um, gestation at increasing ages harder and harder to do. Okay, so that's the anatomy of the ovary. And all of that stuff is going to matter. So that was why we just had a quick little introduction to anatomy. And I was hoping we'd spend a lot of time in the lab learning all these structures, because now we're going to talk about the physiology. Okay, so duct system, the rest of the anatomy from the ovaries, the oos, what, oos. Okay, duct system, the rest of the anatomy. The finger-like extensions of the uterine tubes are going to cause that sweeping-like motion of the interstitial fluid and sweep that ovulated oocyte into the uterine tube. So from the uterine tube, we're going to continue into the uterus, which is the site of gestation. The uterus leads into the vagina. The vagina is the female copulatory organ and birth canal, and that wraps up our anatomy. So let's really get into the physiology. Oogogenesis. What do I want you to worry about oogogenesis? That it begins in utero, actually. So a female is born with all the oocytes she'll ever have, but that's okay because she's got way more than she'll ever need. So um, in utero, we could say that oogogenesis begins in utero. And that before birth, what a female has is all of these primordial follicles with oocytes arrested in meiosis one, which means that they have full maternal and paternal chromosome content. So anytime you see this 2N, that's just two numbers of however many chromosomes various species have. So we're arrested with a full copy of our moms and a full copy of our dad's DNA. And that's how all females start. And so what happens in meiosis 2 is that you've got to replicate all your DNA and then you're going to have, so does anybody remember DNA replication? Well that occurs first. So then we get these replicated strands. And now we've got to cross over this information so that we're all different from each other. So I'll make some blue over here, make some pink over here, some blue over here, some pink over here. I get these crossing over events. But now I've got way too much information. So I need to get this all down. And that's the first thing that happens is when we finish meiosis one. So that's kind of cool. We're going to get rid of two polar bodies with most of that information. And then if fertilization occurs, we're going to get rid of that other piece of uh, chromosomal information. But before birth, this is how it is. We've got all these primordial follicles with their oocytes arrested in meiosis one. Okay? 
until menopause, what we'll have is that we've got primordial, primary, and secondary follicles. And if you want to know what they are, well, just rewind and look at our anatomy review. So that's going to happen is that you'll find in an ovary, and that's what's weird too. That's why I wish that you could be in lab right now looking at slides, because that's what's cool about an ovary. You can look at this ovary and see all of these follicles in these various stages of development, which means you have all of these oocytes in these various stages of meiosis right there in the same ovary. It's pretty cool. So I wish you could look at that, but that's what you see throughout life until menopause. So from birth until menopause, you can see various stages of this development going on. Well, what happens then starting at puberty is that some of these primary follicles are going to start responding to the increasing levels of FSH and developing from those secondary follicles, from the primary follicles into secondary follicles and secondary follicles into tertiary follicles. So from puberty to menopause, we would see that we still have primordial follicles. Not, I mean, not nearly as many because a lot of them are becoming primary and those are becoming secondary. But what happens from puberty to menopause is that once a month, one of these secondary follicles, they say, is going to be rescued from atresia so it's not going to like shrivel up and die. We're going to take it and turn it into this tertiary follicle that is going to complete meiosis one. So if we think about that picture that we just had up, we had these unique chromosomes, and there was like this unique chromosome on one side and this unique chromosome on the other side. Well, when we finish up meiosis one, half of that information now is gone. And so now we just have one copy that we have to get rid of so that we can get to haploid. So What's going to happen here is that um, our secondary follicle is going to get selected, it's going to complete meiosis 1, and then that this tertiary follicle is going to get bigger and bigger and secrete more and more estrogen, and that's going to allow us to have this LH surge, this positive feedback is going to allow for an LH surge, and one tertiary follicle per month should ovulate. So what's a tertiary follicle? Rewind and go back over anatomy. So we'll say one of these, one per month, is selected and ovulates. So it completes meiosis one and leaves to the duct system. Okay, so let's compare oogogenesis to spermatogenesis. So if you recall, in spermatogenesis, we said that one uh, spermatogonium, which was the stem cell, was going to give you four haploid daughter cells, which were our spermatid. Well, what we saw in oogogenesis just now was that one of our oogogonium was going to give us one haploid daughter cell, oogocyte, and three polar bodies. So what we start with up here, one oogogonium is going to give us one haploid oogocyte, that is one N, and three polar bodies take away the other chromosomal information. I can spell polar bodies, I know it. So, that's one difference. Then hopefully this one and one of these one end cells will mix with that one end cell and you happily propagate the species. Okay, so that's one difference. Uh, what else? The error rate is a lot higher in oogogenesis and that increases with age. So you've probably heard that uh, the older a woman gets, the higher her chances of trisomy 21 or Down syndrome go. And that's because in those crossing over events, your error rate goes higher with age. So that's kind of interesting. So oogogenesis has a higher error rate. Oogogenesis begins in utero and ends at menopause.
spermatogenesis has a lower error rate. It begins at puberty and ends at death. Well, they're going to divide by mitosis, so they'll increase in number, 
And then we'll see, oh, our secondary cells have more granulosa, our secondary follicles, pardon me, have more granulosa cells. And then our late secondary follicles have a lot of granulosa cells, and they're really developing a, like a big, huge antrum, a really big fluid-filled space. Oh, you might even see multiple fluid-filled spaces. So FSH is going to be stimulating these cells, these granulosa cells are the targets of FSH. Why? Because they're the cells that have FSH receptors. So when FSH binds, they are going to divide by mitosis and increase in number. Well, they must be doing other things. They're there to support this developing oocyte. So these are very similar to the nurse cells and the testes. They're going to nurture this developing oocyte. So we could also say that our granulosa cells are nurturing the oocyte. So as this is happening, our purple cells are still responding to FSH, and they are going to respond by releasing or by nurturing the oocyte. Uh, they're also going to begin producing inhibin. So the more granulosa cells we have, the more inhibin we get, that we get. The bigger our follicle gets, the more inhibin we get. In a minute, we'll also see we're getting more estrogen, but right now we're just talking about our granulosa cells and FSH. So in the follicular cell, we're really, or in the follicular phase, we're really trying to grow this follicle. So by the time we get to this tertiary phase, what we have is a really big fluid-filled space with lots of granulosa cells. And by the time we're there, we also have really big theca, um, or thecal, a lot of fecal cells as well. OK, so follicular phase. What else is going on here? Um, all right, our fecal cells are the targets for LH. And you only ever see them on the outside of our developing follicle, and our fecal cells are the only cells with LH receptors. So when LH binds, really what we say is that estrogen goes up. The truth of it is, when LH binds, they're going to secrete androgen, and FSH is stimulating the granulosa cells to secrete an enzyme that's going to convert that androgen to estrogen. So the overall effect of LH binding thecal cells is in fact that estrogen goes up. But the chemical synthetic pathway that leads there is organic, organic chemistry. And it goes something like androgen to estrogen. So what well, we'll say, but we'll just say it. Our thecal cells are going to respond to LH, and LH is going to stimulate them to produce androgen which then the granulosa cells are going to convert. So I'm going to put that here in purple. They've got the enzyme that's going to convert that androgen to estradiol. So that what happens is that in, as thecal cell numbers increase, estrogen levels are going to increase. So during the follicular phase, we could also say that uh, estrogen levels are increasing. Okay, let's think about this. What is estrogen going to do? What do we need to do? We need to thicken our uterine wall and get it ready for a potentially uh, fertilized oocyte. So estrogen is targeting the functional layer of the endometrium and stimulating mitosis. So that all during the follicular phase, if you were to look at the menstrual cycle or in the uterine phase, you would see that our uterus is thickening and thickening in response to estrogen. The other thing estrogen is doing is those increasing levels of estrogen are feeding back in a positive feedback mechanism on GnRH secretion. But okay, so what's happening here is that estrogen levels are increasing, inhibit levels are increasing, this thing is getting bigger, estrogen level is increasing, and what it's doing is it's exerting positive feedback on GnRH. So what we'll see is that this, as this, so what we see is as this follicle gets bigger, there's more estrogen release and it's exerting positive feedback. What does that mean? That increasing levels of estrogen lead to increasing levels of GnRH, lead to increasing the stimulation of gonadotropes. 
lead to increasing level of, levels of gonadotropic hormones? Yes, but not so much FSH because inhibin is selectively inhibiting FSH. So we will let LH levels go up. LH will stimulate, stimulate our fecal cells. We'll have higher estrogen levels, which will stimulate more GnRH release. So we'll go into this positive feedback loop. So all of the follicular phase, we could say, is really under positive feedback due to increasing estrogen levels. Okay?
are now going to exert negative feedback or start our negative feedback on GnRH. What does that mean? That they'll the high level of all of those hormones will stop GnRH release. So we'll stop stimulating our gonadotropes. So FSH, which was already low, is going to go down. There was a little bit of a spike, though, if you notice on your figure in your book. But we'll also talk about that in a minute. Um, so FSH and LH are going to go back down, and those declining numbers are going to still be able to stimulate the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone. So a little bit, but that progesterone is going to negatively feed back. So we'll kind of slow it off, lower it off, so the progesterone will peak, and GnRH then is really going to drop. FSH and LH are really going to drop, and if there are no signals from a uh, uh, fertilized oocyte, then what's going to happen is that the corpus luteum is going to die. It's going to stop secreting progesterone because there is no LH and FSH, and it, that uterine wall is going to shrivel up and regress, and that's what's lost in menses. Okay, so. What can we say about the luteal phase? What else would we want to say is that this, if I was writing a sentence about the luteal phase, I'll just write it over here. The luteal phase is from ovulation, so day 14, to about day 26 or take day 28. It depends. So to around day 26 or 28. And then what happens here is that we said ours wasn't fertilized, so absent fertilization, the corpus luteum is going to regress, so or the corpus luteum is going to die and become this scar tissue called the corpus albicans. So it'll shrivel up and become the corpus albicans, scar tissue. So what's happening as far as hormones go is our progesterone and our estrogen levels are going to drop off, and we will release the hypothalamus from this negative feedback. So the luteal phase is from ovulation to about day 26 or day 28 absent fertilization, and then what's going to happen is the corpus luteum is going to die, or it's going to regress, undergo atresia, and become the corpus albicans, which is just scar tissue. So if we think about follicle development throughout the ovarian cycle, we go from these kind of arrested follicles that aren't doing much to these um, primary follicles that become these secondary follicles that get more fecal cells that are releasing more estrogen. So if we're thinking about hormonally, sex hormone levels, at the beginning of the follicular phase, really not a whole lot of anything is being released. But as those cells are responding to increasing levels of FSH, they will start becoming bigger. The follicle will develop and we'll go from our primary follicles to our secondary follicles. We'll start seeing the appearance of fecal cells that will be secreting estrogen at higher and higher levels. Then we'll get bigger and bigger. FSH is going to stimulate our granulosa cells. We'll get bigger. We'll get more fecal cells. Uh, we'll develop more estrogen. And so we get these increasing levels of estrogen are going to positively feed back on GnRH release so that we can get a GnRH surge for ovulation. So what happens with our estrogen is it's going to be high from this developing follicle. At ovulation, we have a little bit of a dip, but then it stays pretty high from the corpus luteum. Unless we don't have fertilization, then it's going to drop off as the corpus albicans develops, and um, we start the cycle over. If we think about the other important hormone, that's progesterone. So progesterone was really low throughout the follicular phase. It was zero, and that's because all we want to be developing this oocyte so it can be fertilized, hopefully. So all throughout the follicular phase of the ovary, progesterone is low. But at ovulation, what's going to happen is progesterone now is going to start going up. So we'll enter our luteal phase, and now in the luteal phase, progesterone and estrogen are high. Progesterone is going to drop off, absent fertilization, and that's estrogen. Progesterone is going to drop off fertilization, and now the functional layer of the uterus will regress, and menses will begin. So that's where we're going, is to talk about the menstrual cycle that is the result of these sex hormones, but if you look, then these are kind of the hormones that are being produced due to the changes in the ovary. So the changes in the ovary are going to cause these changes in the sex hormone profile, which are going to cause uterine changes, which are then going to be what's 
responsible for allowing us to grow this nice, really nutrient-rich environment for this hopefully fertilized oomocyte. Our oomocyte's not going to get fertilized. So, okay. I don't really want to erase this picture yet, so I'll just ask you the question. You're going to listen and read underneath the words here. Blank stimulates the anterior pituitary to release follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. A. Progesterone. B. Estrogen. C. Inhibit. D. Gonadotropin-releasing hormone. So blank stimulates the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH. Progesterone, estrogen, inhibin, or GnRH? Oh, you're right, it's GnRH, the gonadotropin releasing hormone. That stimulates the release of our gonadotropins, FSH and LH. FSH is then going to stimulate follicle development. LH is going to stimulate ultimately an increase in estrogen by producing androgens that can convert to estrogens by an enzyme, the granulosa cells are making, but the answer is GnRH stimulates LH and LH production. Okay, so this is the ovarian cycle. We've just talked about that. These are the hormones that are produced throughout the ovarian cycle. How do we get the ovarian cycle regulated? So that all starts up in the master controller of the autonomic nervous system and endocrine systems, and that was the hypothalamus. So I want to get this guy to his babysitter and be right back to talk about that. Alright, so let's talk about the hormonal regulation of the ovarian cycle. This is where it gets a little tricky. So in developing girls, low levels of estrogen inhibit follicle development, but after puberty that's not always so. So like in your book it probably shows that inhibition is happening in the first couple of days due to low levels of estrogens. And that's only true in children and some adults. So what is true for everyone all the time after puberty is that increasing levels of estrogen are going to exert a positive feedback effect on GnRH release. So this is what makes the female brain female is that it has what's called the GnRH surge center. And the GnRH surge center, as opposed to responding to increasing levels of estrogen as you would expect in a negative feedback way, causes the brain to respond to increasing estrogen levels in a positive feedback way. So as estrogen levels go up, GnRH goes up, which causes increasing stimulation of the gonadotropic cells in the anterior pituitary, so they should start increasing their levels of gonadotropic hormones. LH is going to go up, but FSH is going to cause its own negative feedback loop by stimulating granulosa cells to produce inhibin. So FSH isn't going to go up to the magnitude that LH is going to go up, which is perfect because we need to be able to get an LH surge. So as estrogen levels increase in the body and inhibin levels increase, this is going to cause increased GnRH, increased LH, increased estrogen, increased GnRH, increased LH, and that will allow us to have ovulation. After ovulation, progesterone is going to be released from the corpus luteum and it will stay high as long as the corpus luteum is around. If there's no fertilization, corpus luteum can only live for about two weeks. So it's going to die and become a structure called the corpus albicans. And when that happens, progesterone, estrogen, and inhibin levels are going to drop. The hypothalamus will be released from negative feedback. And the positive feedback due to increasing estrogen levels will resume. So that's what's going on with kind of the profile. Let's look at it and write it all down. So hormonal regulation of the ovarian cycle. Let's draw back. Here's our hypothalamus up here. And it's exerting control over the anterior pituitary by the control of the gonadotropic releasing hormone. So our gonadotropic releasing hormone, GnRH. When action potentials are fired in these hypothalamic neurons, they'll release GnRH into the hypothalamal hypothesial portal system, it will end with capillaries in the primary plexus, travel through portal veins, and pool around all of the cells in the anterior pituitary. But the only ones with GnRH receptors are our gonadotropes, which are going to respond by releasing FSH and LH. FSH is going to target the 
the granulosa cells. And what's it going to stimulate? It's going to stimulate them to nurture the oocyte. It's going to stimulate them to produce inhibin. This inhibin is going to come back and selectively negatively feed back and inhibit FSH release from the gonadotropes. So that as long as GnRH is bound and stimulating our gonadotropes, we'll release LH but not FSH. The other thing that is going to happen is it's going to produce an enzyme. And this enzyme is going to convert androgen to estrogen. We really give the kind of responsibility for estrogen levels increasing to LH, and that's because when it enters the blood, it's going to stimulate our thecal cells, and they're making the androgen that can convert it to estrogen. So when LH is present, it's going to cause estrogen levels to go up in the body. So LH is going to stimulate our thecal cells, and what we'll say is that ultimately estrogen levels are going to go up, so estrogen levels increase, this increase in estrogen is sensed by the hypothalamus. So increasing estrogen is going to increase stimulation of my GnRH producing neurons. They're going to increase GnRH release into the hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system. GnRH is going to go up and increase the stimulation of my gonadotropes. So they in theory should release more LH and more FSH. But FSH is setting up its own negative feedback loop through this inhibit production, which is going to allow Then we'll have this LH surge. We could say this is going to cause ovulation. So the surge causes ovulation. And now this LH is going to stimulate the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone. So for the last part of our hormonal regulation of the ovarian cycle, after ovulation, we could say LH is going to stimulate the corpus luteum to secrete estrogen, progesterone, and inhibin. These three things are going to exert potent negative feedback on GnRH. So we will drop GnRH, we will drop stimulation of our gonadotropes, so we'll drop FSH even more so than LH because inhibin is on board. LH is going to start decreasing. For a little bit, we'll stimulate the corpus luteum to produce progesterone. It's the luteinizing hormone in control of the luteal phase, which causes progesterone release. But the corpus luteum can only survive for two, e two weeks without fertilization. If fertilization occurs, that little dividing ball of cells is going to send signals back to the ovary that will maintain the corpus luteum. That can still only last for about three months. By three months, the placenta has to take over. But right now, our oocyte hasn't been fertilized. So there won't be any signals coming from some dividing mass of cells. And so the corpus luteum is going to last its maximum amount of time, two weeks. It's going to disintegrate and become the corpus albicans, which isn't producing anything. Estrogen, progesterone, and inhibit drop off. And we start the cycle again. So, um, yeah, that's our hormonal regulation of the ovarian cycle. What do all these changing hormones do to the uterus? So the uterus is under what's called the uterine cycle, or it's undergoing the uterine cycle. And these are all of the changes to that innermost layer, the stratum functionalis of the endometrium. And the endometrium is responding first to estrogen, and then to progesterone, and then to decreasing levels of progesterone. And they're going to give us these phases of the uterine or the menstrual cycle. So if you recall, we started out cycle with day one of the menstrual cycle because it's something that we can see. That's menses. So menses is days one through five. I'm going to draw this in red. So menses is days one through five. And what's happening here is the stratum functionalis is sloughing off because it's dead. <laughs> so our stratum functionalis is sloughing Why is it dead? Because progesterone and estrogen levels plummeted at the end of the ovarian cycle when the corpus albicans developed. 
So the cells here died off, and now they're sloughing off. So menses is days one through five, when the stratum functionalis at the endometrium sloughs off. So estrogen is stimulating first that stratum basale, but then the stratum functionalis, to undergo mitosis and proliferate those endometrial cells and increase them in number. So during our proliferative phase, what we can say is increasing estrogen levels are going to stimulate mitosis in the endometrium. So we're going to increase in number. We'll have a large increase in cell number in that stratum functionalis. Okay, and this is the example, the great example of permissiveness. All during this time, estrogen is causing the stratum functionalis to increase its production of progesterone receptors. Progesterone is not high right now, but progesterone is going to be high after ovulation, so I'm going to permit its effect by stimulating the production of progesterone receptors. So we could say that another thing that's happening during this proliferative phase is that estrogen is stimulating progesterone receptor production here in the stratum functionalis. And this is permissiveness, or the permissive interaction. Okay, any questions? I'm sure you have a million. You can pop them in that discussion board. Okay, then the last phase of the menstrual cycle, or the uterine cycle, is the secretory phase. And this is after ovulation, when progesterone starts going high and can bind to all those nice progesterone receptors, then what's going to happen is progesterone is stimulating what we call hypertrophy, or an increase in growth and size, and hyperemia, or an increase in the production of all of these uterine glands and vessels. So it's the secretory phase because our uterus becomes super secretory and really rich, so that if that oocyte gets fertilized, it's got a nice, nutrient-rich environment to burrow into. So our secretory phase, this is from ovulation to about day 26 or 28, so it varies per female, but it won't go beyond, it shouldn't go beyond day 28 for anybody, uh, because corpus lutea can only last for 14 days. I mean, I guess if you have a really long cycle, then atresia could begin later, but it's not because of the corpus lutea, and that's just, you would have, I guess, a longer follicular phase. So our secretory phase is from ovulation to about day 26 or day 27, and what's happening here in these last couple days is the corpus albicans is developing. And as that happens, what's happening in the uterus is in these last couple days, uh, the stratum functionalis is regressing. Those cells are dying because of the declining levels of estrogen and progesterone. So they're regressing so that they can be sloughed off here in menses. So for the last part of our secretory phase, we could say the stratum functionalis regresses. Oh, and now it's dead so that we can start again. And days one through five, we'll have menses and slough off that stratum functionalis. Days five through 14 are increasing levels of estrogen from the increasing size of that follicle are going to increase the development of my stratum functionalis. I'll increase in number and thicken. And then after ovulation, when progesterone is high, I will increase um, my blood vessel number. That's called hyperemia. It's stimulated by progesterone. So progesterone is going to stimulate hyperemia which is an increase in blood vessels and uterine glands. It's probably just the blood vessels, emia, but we also get an increase in uterine glands. And then we, progesterone is also going to stimulate um, hypertrophy, which is an increase in growth. So estrogen is still high, so we can still be increasing in 
number my mitosis for a bit. Uh, but progesterone is really going to be what's new, and progesterone, progesterone stimulates hypertrophy and hyperemia during the secretory phase. And that is the end of the uterine cycle. So what are the effects of our estrogens and progesterones? Well, everything we associate with being female. So estrogens really kind of help with the, helping with the differential fat distribution or adipose distribution during development. So estrogens can help with adipose deposition in the mammary and um, kind of hip regions. So this we could say stimulates, stimulates adipose deposition in the mammary and coxal <laughs> regions. Um, obviously, it stimulates the uh, thickening of our uterus, but what are other effects? Um, progesterones are also going to kind of help, but these are really going to stimulate mammary gland development when you're pregnant. So progesterone is going to really stimulate mammary gland development, where estrogen is really helping to stimulate uh, mammary region development. So progesterone stimulates the kind of production of mammary glands. Uh, both of them together kind of stimulate nurturing behavior. Uh, everything kind of associated with being female. Okay, so here's your brain break. Remember last week when I was telling you about how mallards were rapists? That's kind of weird because mallards are also monogamous breeders. So how are you a violent rapist but also monogamous? Your female's vagina is how. So uh, male and female ducks will like pick mating pairs, but I, I also have noticed this. There are a lot more mallards than there are female ducks out there. What are female ducks called? I don't know. But anyway, there are a lot more males than females. So, you know, everybody's trying to propagate their species. So these non-monogamous, well, so these non-breeding pair mallards will rape these four poor females when their male's off doing his thing. So how can you make sure you don't get pregnant by the wrong duck? You can grow a fake vagina. And so it's pretty cool. That's what they do, is that they get all these like corkscrew shaped vaginas. So mallard penises also look like corkscrews, weird. And so what they can do is they develop all of these extra like fake vaginas and they're all corkscrew shaped because pen penises are corkscrew shaped in the duck realm. And so yeah, what will happen then is if she's being raped by some other mallard, then she'll just like close off her real vagina and open up a fake vagina so that he is going into the wrong vagina and so that he doesn't get impregnated by the wrong male. Isn't that fascinating? Or is it too much information? <laughs> There's not too much information. Okay, this is the last thing that we need to talk about in our female reproductive system, and this is the female sexual response, which really only has two phases, uh, arousal and orgasm. Females do not have a resolution phase. So what we can say for our female sexual response is that we have an arousal and really here. Like males are producing an, a, an erection and that's really important. Now the erectoral body, the clitoris, is becoming engorged, but it's not having the same kind of important function that the male erection is. So we don't call this like the erection phase. And the male phase is really arousal, but what happens in arousal is they produce a significant erection. But what is happening here in arousal is still our parasympathetic nervous system is under control and the clitoris is going to engorge with blood. The blood flow is going to change and the clitoris is going to engorge with blood. The, those greater vestibular glands are going to become active and secrete vestibular fluid onto the vestibule of the vagina and lubricate the vagina. So another thing that we could say is the greater vestibular glands become active And this is going to lubricate the vagina. So we'll say it lubricates the vaginal orifice. And then the sympathetic nervous system is going to take over at the time of orgasm. And what happens in orgasm is not the same as ejaculation in males. And ejaculation, that was a really distinct.
interesting two-part process where we had emission, all the secretions of sperm and movement of all those fluids, seminal fluid, prostatic fluid, and then expulsion where it was forcefully expelled from the male reproductive tract. Females don't have that. They have orgasm. Say is that oxytocin is released, so there's contraction of reproductive smooth muscle, so the vagina and uterus are going to contract. In combination with semen, we should have reverse peristalsis to pull that ejaculated semen up to the fallopian tubes. Uh, and then we'll have widespread skeletal muscle contraction. And if you think about what the sympathetic nervous system is doing, it's increasing heart rate, increasing respiration, increasing skeletal muscle contraction, and all of those are observable signs of orgasm. So during orgasm, the sympathetic nervous system is in control, and we could say what is happening is that there's oxytocin release, which should stimulate uh, uterine and vaginal contraction. And then our sympathetic nervous system is going to stimulate widespread skeletal muscle contraction. Well, your somatic nervous system is stimulating this widespread skeletal muscle contraction. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system is really in control of um, all of orgasm. Um, and what we could say is that we're increasing our heart rate and increasing respiration rate as well. All right, that wraps up the female reproductive system. Hope it's been a blast. <laughs> really get that head tight. Okay, okay, okay. I gotta get my head just right. That's what she said.